hits all the time. We are family. Outstanding effort again. We're busting ours to kick yours. That's big time. Minus 15. Respect all, fear none. Oh, did he felt that one? Intensity is not a perfume. It was a no doubter. Five, four, three, two, one. We are up in the bird's nest here at Oriole Park in Camden Yards. I'm Brendan Mortensen alongside Matt Bonaparte. It feels like baseball weather outside here at Camden Yards. We've got weather in the 70s this week in Baltimore. Opening day is just a couple of weeks away. Went outside and played catch yesterday. That was huge. Nothing better than just playing catch. It, it's it's baseball season. How you, how's the elbow feeling? The arm. Elbow's feeling great. You, you fine know? for the season? Probably should have gotten TJ in like high school. Got a got a little tingling sensation in my fingers when I throw too hard sometimes. But you know it, that's did that's we get the that yesterday? Today. That's the question. We did a little bit. Uh, okay. But that's that's the early we'll season case. We got to work out. Be fine. It'll right. be okay. Right. Much like Aaron Boone talking about Garrett Cole. You know, we're not not worried about it. It's gonna be yeah. fine. And then we're a little worried about it, and then we're really worried about it. But, you know, we're going to be ready for opening day. We're going to be here. I don't, I don't need to throw all that much on our broadcast. Too. Yeah, you don't have to throw it all, actually. Uh, so Arguably don't at worry all. About that. Yeah. I've never seen you throw, actually, so it's okay. Well, that's just not true at all. I mean, in, in the podcast studio. Oh, in the podcast studio. Yeah. yeah. We, we do run some rec softball. We do. We do. It gets nice. If you uh, have been a long-time listener, you'll have remembered... How I retold the story of Brendan's famous Vladimir Guerrero-esque throw sure. uh, that saved the winning run and won us a, a, a softball game. So uh, only true podcast sicko, listeners, yeah, yeah. Birds Nest listeners will know that. Sicko listeners will understand that reference. And if you're not a sicko listener, good job. You you probably didn't waste your time too much listening to this show. But if you are a, a good listener of the last few weeks, you will remember that last week and a special bonus episode on Friday. We had our all Orioles draft draft. It was a fun one. We were yeah. joined by old friend of the show, Tim Leonard. And we went through and we drafted the best teams possible from players that the Orioles selected in the amateur draft. Now, if you remember, the rules of the draft were the player pool. It was only players that the Orioles selected in the amateur draft, which means we could not draft players like Jim Palmer, like Brooks Robinson, who were fantastic Orioles, but were signed by the team before the amateur draft became a thing. Only player stats with the Orioles count. So players like Kevin Gossman were drafted, but only their stats with the Orioles will be considered. And we had no future projections. So we could have drafted, well, we didn't draft guys like Jackson Holiday and Colton Kowser, who we assume will be very good Orioles draft picks, but they haven't done it yet. So those guys were not selected in the draft. Let's run through the teams a little bit. You can go right now on Twitter and Facebook and vote for which team you think is the best. We'll start with Tim's team because he's not here to defend himself. It's a nice, well-rounded team for Tim. He's got a great corner of the infield in Eddie Murray and Doug DeSensei. Bobby Gritch at shortstop I think is one of the more underrated picks in the draft. Bobby Gritch, a really, really solid player, and if you don't know too much about Bobby Gritch's peak in an Orioles uniform. You should look it up. He's got Nick Markakis in right field, a fan favorite. Ben McDonald, Eric Bedard, John Means in the starting rotation. Then he's got Greg Olson as his top reliever. It's a solid, well-rounded team for Tim. Eddie Murray, Nick Markakis, the two big names on his team. Uh, yeah, I'll have some power. I'll have some good defense, but uh, I just don't think he holds a candle to mine. Yeah, well, we'll go through your team here, Matt. You're doing well so far on the Twitter and Facebook votes. You've got Matt Wieters, left side of the infield looks nice, and Manny Machado and Gunnar Henderson. I think you've got the best outfield with Al Bumbry, Cedric Mullins, Don Baylor. And then the top two in the starting rotation is nice in Mike Messina and Mike Boddicker. I don't know how you're doing in a seven-game series because the rest of your starting rotation it was well, just not very good. But whoa, whoa, your Brian team looks good if you're trying Robinson, to win one game. They, they've thrown good starts before. Look, if, fact. if you're trying to win one game, I, I go with your team. Two. It looks nice on a graphic. Two Maybe games. two games. If you're trying to win two also games. Also, the best bullpen. Seven game series. I don't know if I'm giving it to your team there, Matt. Well, you'd be wrong. Um, <laughs> and I'm glad that you played. But uh, at the end of the day, my team is the best. And I can't help but smile when I look at it because it's fantastic. Sure. And, and that's fine. And when we look onto my team, if we're really looking at the integrity of the game here, 
You know, if you're looking at the team that has, integrity has the, the best war, that's just going to be my team. Up the middle, I've got Adley Rutschman, Kyle Rifkin Jr., Brian Roberts, Austin Hayes in center, the all-star. I think I've got far and away the best starting rotation. And, you know, again, if we're looking at a seven-game series between our two teams, I, I think I know who I'm going with. But, again, your team looks a little better on the graphic. Go give me that. I need to make that starting rotation portion of the graphic bigger. I do. No, you don't. That was on me. At the end of the day, that was on me. Should have made it bigger. Well, at the end of the day... You lose. <laughs> well, you we'll lose. see. There's still plenty of time to vote on which team you think was the best of time. the all Orioles draft drafts. Go on Twitter. Go on Facebook. Cast your vote. You can do it right now as you're listening to us live on YouTube and Facebook. We're not going to spend all day talking about the all Orioles draft draft bones. We've got plenty of things to talk about from Orioles spring training. Plenty of things we didn't get to last week because we've got a pretty solid sample size right now of some of the Orioles' top prospects, and my goodness, do we need to talk about how good they have been. Yes, we do. <laughs> I, I didn't know you were throwing that to me. Yeah, yeah I was. This team, uh, you know, we came into, this, into spring training excited to see the Orioles' prospects, and at the end of the day, when you look around baseball and the history of baseball, it just doesn't always pan out for a lot of guys, regardless of how highly they were touted. That is not the case here. Yeah, These guys have met the hype. They've met the expectations that were set out for them, and it's been really fun to watch them. Uh, Jackson Holiday, Kobe Mayo, and Colton Kowser especially have been lighting the world on fire, and I'm excited to talk about them. Yeah, let's, let's talk about the number one prospect in baseball. Okay. Let's talk Jackson Holiday. Through his first 10 spring training games, he is hitting 323 he is. with a 957 OPS. He's got 10 hits, two doubles, two triples, and a home run, which was a grand slam against the Blue Jays. Now, the 344 on base percentage is a little bit low for a 323 batting average. He, he does have 12 strikeouts and just one walk. I think you would like to see the plate approach improve a little bit. However, hard to complain about a 20 year old hitting 323 with a 957 OPS in his first 10 spring training games. Yeah, I think he's just trying to go out and hit the ball, which is why the, the strikeout to walk numbers. Probably aren't what you'd want, but sure. I don't really care. <laughs> so uh, I'm, I'm yeah. happy to see Holiday going out there and smacking the baseball. We've seen a grand slam from this kid. Uh, we've seen plenty of extra base hits. He, he's been fantastic. Uh, and, and, you know, we heard Ryan O'Hearn and many others say that he has a perfect swing, a right. pure swing. And we've seen that on display. He's been that good. It's been incredible to watch him play. Uh, and I, I really, really enjoyed seeing him in the box against – Pretty darn good pitchers. On Baseball Reference, you can see uh, the opponent quality that any hitter has faced. It's a 7.8 right now. I believe 8 is double A, 9 is triple A, and then 10 is a big leaguer. Um, so double A average. But I challenge you to find another hitter with the same amount of plate appearances that has a higher one. I mean, pretty much everybody hovers around from 7.5 to like 8. Right. Um, so not out of the ordinary there. I'm happy to see what he's been doing. Yeah, the opponent quality is is a big one there. I mean, as you mentioned, Holiday at a 7.8 on that scale, where 7 is double A, 8 is triple A, 10 is major league talent. And according to baseball reference, he's at a 7.8. So yeah. he is getting it done against a lot of quality pitching right now. And when you're looking at the second base discussion, I do think it is a second base discussion when you're talking about Jackson Holiday. Yeah, I, I don't think, think he's, yeah. he's going to play some shortstop. He's not going to play any third base. I think it is pretty much down to who do you think is the best second baseman on this roster. Because Jordan Westberg, if you think Jackson Holiday is good enough to start at second base, then Jordan Westberg can just be your close to everyday third baseman along with Ramona Rios. You can rotate those guys around a good bit. So Jordan Westberg playing well. We have I've heard a little bit of Jordan Westberg factoring into the Jackson Holiday discussion. I don't think he factors in at all. I think Jordan Westbrook is going to get close to everyday starts no matter what happens with Jackson Holiday. Really, with Holiday, I think you're looking at second base. Is Jackson Holiday your best option there? Right now, Colton Wong has played six spring training games. He's got two hits. The OPS isn't great. Not that I really thought that Colton Wong would make the decision on whether or not Jackson Holiday was going to make this opening day roster, but he's certainly competition. You've got Jackson Holiday, you're trying to evaluate if he's ready to make the opening day roster, if he is big league ready. And then you have Colton Wong, who has had a really solid, what, eight-plus year big league career at this point. 
and you know what he would give you at the big league level. If you think Jackson Holiday can give you more than that, then he might win that job for opening day. Right now, if it is a true competition for who is going to get that opening day start at second base, I think Jackson Holiday is winning that. Yeah, I mean, at this point, and there's plenty of room to go here, but at this point it seems pretty much uh, like, I mean, if he keeps playing this way, I, I would, I'd be hard-pressed to find a reason not to keep him off the opening day roster. Sure. Um, and, and, you know, like you said, Colton Wong has experience. He's a good player, um, but he is probably on the back nine of his career. And, uh, you know, we saw Holiday talk about that, you know, he knew Colton Wong because his dad played with Colton. So I wouldn't be surprised if this was a move by the front office just to get another familiar face in the clubhouse for him at spring training. He knows this guy. Um, also, he could probably learn something from Colton Wong, who is, you know, historically a very, very good defender at the second base position. Um, sure, I mean, I guess it's competition for him, but uh, at the end of the day, I don't really see Colton Wong standing in Jackson Holiday's way. No, it, especially with how those two guys are playing right now. I think if you were trying to evaluate Jackson Holiday this spring training, as we've talked about before, part of the equation was, is he going to play well enough to make this big league roster? And just, is he flat out ready to be in the big leagues? He's just yeah. 20 years old. We have heard so much, obviously, about the pedigree, about the fact that he's grown up around a big league clubhouse. He knows how to conduct himself and carry himself in a way that would convince you that he is a major leaguer, but you needed to see it over a consistent period of time in big league camp. And we aren't really part of... That's hard to tell, right? Yeah. We can watch as many games as we want to. We can look at the numbers. We can talk about how well he's playing. We're not inside the clubhouse. We're not inside we the building. Been. Well, we have been. And We're not in inside the clubhouse right now. inside the clubhouse, he's acted like every other guy who's yeah. been in the league for a long time. I mean, I can't say that I could point out uh, in a lineup who has never been in the Major League Clubhouse and who has, but I tell you that Jackson Holiday acts like the veterans. Yeah. Um, and he he's friends with everybody, talks to everybody. He's just a, you know, he's a chill guy. Yeah, for and the amount of time that we were there, literally in the clubhouse, he does absolutely seem like he fits in. My point was just more so we're not in those conversations with Brandon Hyde and sure. Mike Elias. But everything about his maturity level is, of course, pointing in the right direction. His play is just backing it up as well. Yeah, His play is reinforcing the fact that he seems like he is ready from all accounts, from, from teammates, from the front office, from everybody who has talked about the way that he carries himself. He seems like he's ready. And his play is certainly reflecting that. His first three or four games, he got off to a bit of, slow, of a slow start. He's been on fire since then. Yeah. So everything to me is pointing towards Jackson Holiday probably being on this opening day roster, which is kind of wild. I, I, at the beginning of the offseason, we thought it was a very remote chance. We heard from Michael Elias at winter meetings who said they're going to give him every opportunity to make the team. And now, a couple of weeks into spring training, I'd put his odds at probably 80% yeah. right now. And, you know, that doesn't surprise me because, you know, like you said, they're going to give him every opportunity. And what does Jackson Holiday do with opportunities? Yeah. He, he takes him and he runs with him. Right. Uh, and, and that's no different here. So I think that, uh, you know, he at this point, like we've said, I think he probably should make the roster uh, if he can, continues to play this well in spring training. And I think he would really help this team. I mean, if you've got a kid like that playing as well as we know he can, that infield's probably one of the best, if not the best, in baseball. I mean, really, it really is. Yeah. Fantastic talent all the way around. I would say it's certainly the most promising infield in baseball. Yeah, I think so, too. If you're factoring Adley Rutschman into that you are. infield well, conversation as well. You've got Adley, a catcher. Ryan Mountcastle is really the oldest of the group, and he's not that old of a guy at first yeah. base. Mountie, Holiday, Gunner, Westberg, that's some of the highest upside players. That's pretty unbelievable. In too. baseball. Yeah, I mean, that, that's ridiculous. And, yeah. you know, Westberg's your, your fourth guy there in the infield, or fifth guy for counting Rutschman. Yeah. He's still fantastic. You know, yeah. he still was a top prospect for the Orioles and came up and really produced a lot and contributed a ton to a team that won over 100 games. Yeah, it's a so, top 100 prospect. Still. Yeah, absolutely. And so, you know, even he's your last guy in the bunch, he's still really good. Really, really and, good. Then, and he rounds out a terrific infield. Two other points that I want to make about Jackson Holiday here. The first one being, if this is a couple of years ago, I don't know if Jackson Holiday has a chance to make this opening day roster. No, because if you're not looking to compete, 
then you're probably just giving Jackson Holiday every opportunity in the minor leagues to make sure that he is 100%, without a doubt, ready to go. Mm -hmm. That's not the case right now. Yeah. You're trying to compete. You're trying to win the AL East. You're trying to make a deep playoff push. Right now, you are looking at whether or not Jackson Holiday gives you the best opportunity to win baseball games. Yes. Yes, you are trying to be careful with his development. You don't want to rush him. You don't want to bring him up too early and do something that could potentially hurt him down the line. But right now, you're trying to win baseball games. And if you think that Jackson Holiday being on this opening day roster gives you the best chance to do that, then Jackson Holiday is going to be on this team. And second, the new rule that Major League Baseball implemented that we have seen in practice is the rule with rookies of the year and giving you compensatory draft picks in the first round. Yeah. The Orioles got one this year from Gunnar Henderson winning AL rookie of the year a season ago. Jackson Holiday, if he makes this opening day roster, I think he has to be the odds on favorite to win American League rookie of the year. Right. I'm not an odds maker, so I have no idea. I mean, he would have to. But be. He'd, he'd have to be in the conversation. The number one prospect sure. in baseball, I would imagine, is going to have some of the best odds to win Rookie of the Year. Yeah. So if Jackson Holiday comes up and does that, not only is he helping you win baseball games, but he's also potentially giving you another first-round pick. Yeah. I mean, and just going back to your point about the state the franchise is in and what that does to the conversation, I think you're absolutely right about that. Um, you're now looking at that conversation as okay i don't care about manipulating service time or anything like that or who's going to be doing this that and the other thing in terms of development who's going to play the best baseball at second base yeah and now it's jackson holiday um and and yes you're absolutely right in terms of the rookie of the year conversation they already used that pick or i don't know if it was that pick or the other compensatory pick they had that they traded to the brewers for corbin burns so they used those picks um, and also, draft picks are like gold to the Orioles. Yep. You know, it, it, oh, in another conversation, look at that. Um, that and for saying. another franchise, you probably don't value that pick as much as the Orioles do. But we know what Baltimore can do with first round picks, even second round picks. Gunner was not a uh, a top forty pick. So I mean, yes, I think that the the draft pick conversation might also play into that. Yeah, absolutely. And for a team that is not going to be selecting high in the first round anymore, like getting this two picks dangerous. in the... Yeah, that, that's... <laughs> I don't know why you're still doing that, but you made a good catch last time. I've been doing it for time. weeks. Uh, well, finally now you know... Finally shot up with me. But for a team that is not selecting high in the first round anymore, they're not getting the number one overall pick, it is very valuable to have multiple picks in the late 20s and 30s yeah, now. No, true. Absolutely. That's I agree. Huge. Yeah. That's right around where Gunnar Henderson was selected. So we know that the Orioles don't necessarily need the number one overall pick to still make a high impact selection in the first round. Let's move on from Holiday and talk about maybe the star of spring training right now for the Baltimore Orioles, and that's Colton Kowser. Through his first 10 games, hitting 478 with a 586 on base percentage, slugging 1,000 with an OPS of 1,586. He's got 11 hits, four homers, just seven strikeouts, and four walks. That That's unbelievable numbers. Yeah. I mean, what can we say about yeah, this there's man? That, there's like, not much to say yeah, about those numbers. He's a big leaguer. Like, right. he just is. Um, and, you know, I, I, I just think he's running away with that competition. Yeah. I just do. Um, and you know, the Stowers is hitting incredibly well as well. Um, so there's that, but I just think Colton Kowser is the man. Yeah. Uh, Brian on Facebook saying we have to remember these are practice games. Pitchers are experimenting with their pitches That's during true. the game. Probably wouldn't see the same pitches during the regular season, which is true for all of these guys, but it's true for all of these guys. Like it, holiday Kowser and Mayo are hitting incredibly well. Yes. In spring training. But the guys that they're competing against for roster spots are facing those same pitchers. And yeah, so uh, to Brian, I, I just want to say that I don't expect dear Brian. Colton Kowser to begin the season with a 1600 OPS. You don't? Necessarily. Um, I but, do. Okay. Anything well, less than that is a disappointment. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I'm still happy to see him do it now. Yeah. I, I'd rather him do it than not do it. I, under, I understand your point, Brian, and I think you're right. You'd rather him hit some, 478 than not hit yeah, 478. I think just some people Good may take. take spring training statistics a little bit too far, but 
In this conversation, I think that it's worth taking what he's done into account. But I do think that opens up a, a valid question there where, as you just said, sometimes we take spring training n- numbers and we run a little bit too far with them. But yeah. That's literally what we're doing that's right now. That's the point. We're, we're talking about <laughs> these spring training numbers and how good these top prospects have been. So let's keep having that fourth outfielder conversation, but have it in a little bit of, of a different way now that we have the numbers. As you mentioned, Colton Kowser is just tearing the cover off the ball. And yeah. and you think he has a leg up in the fourth outfielder conversation. Kyle Stowers has an OPS over 900 and is hitting 270. That's really, really good. He has displayed his also power. mashing lefties. Yeah, mashing lefties, which is huge for Kyle Stowers, who you would like to have him be a quality defensive replacement and, you know, just be a fill-in regardless of who the starting pitcher is. Even if it is a lefty, you could get him in the lineup there as well. The two outfielders in this conversation, Daniel Johnson, by the way, is hitting really, really well. I just don't know if he is in kind of the core four. Daniel Johnson might have had a shot if Heston Kerstad and Colton Kowser and Ryan McKenna and Kyle Stowers weren't right ahead of him. It, yeah. <laughs> I, <laughs> like, I'm sorry, Daniel. Daniel Johnson's a, a but, quality player but and to, has showed up very well in spring training. He's trying out for every other team in baseball. Yeah. Too, don't so. want to completely omit him, but I, I think these other guys have a leg up. We have the spring training numbers to shine a positive light on Colton Kowser and Kyle Stowers right now. Heston Kerstad has a 593 OPS hitting 258, and Ryan McKenna has a 583 OPS hitting just 143. Yeah. Those are the two guys that have shown you good things at the big league level. Brandon Hyde, we have talked about it a lot, has raved about Ryan McKenna and everything that he brings to the big league club, whether that's in the clubhouse or as a, def- a defensive replacement playing in all three outfield spots or just as a right-handed platoon bat against lefties. He has hit lefties very well in his big league career. Heston Kerstad came up last season and had a 748 OPS in 13 big league games, which is a larger sample size than we have seen in spring training right now. So how much are we evaluating spring training versus the two guys in Heston Kerstad and Ryan McKenna who are struggling a little bit more in spring training, but have shown you a lot more at the big league level. Uh, I think that what you've shown in the big leagues last year is more important than what you've done right now. I agree. Uh, Though it's also a case by case basis, you know, for Kowser, especially who, like you said, didn't put up the best numbers in the big leagues uh, when he came up last year, I'm pretty happy to see him do it right now. Um, For a guy like Kerstad, who, Came up at the end of last season, made the playoff roster, contributed a little bit. I don't, it's fine. Like, it's okay. I'm really not ringing the alarm bells about Heston Kerstad. No, me neither. Um, Though I am curious, and this is a question I can't answer, and I don't think you can either, maybe. Um, I'm curious what it does to the fourth outfield conversation. In Mike Elias' eyes, does he have some kind of preset notion that, does he have a number that says, all right, if if he does this poorly, I don't care, but if he does this poorly, I do? Like, I don't know what his thinking is, and I'm curious about what or how much this performance actually plays into it, or if it's more of just, we know that Kowser's glove is better, and we know he can hit just yeah. as well. We're going to put Kowser on the team. Or is it Ryan McKenna? You know, he doesn't expect to play every day. How much does that you know, throw a wrench into things that Kowser and Kerstad probably want more playing time or something sure. like that, and they don't need... Uh, you know, they don't need more development in the minor leagues, but you can't promise them a spot in the outfield every single day. Well, it's not a Kowser and Kerstad want to play every day. They just want to be on the big league team. It's yeah, no, you it wasn't... need to get top prospects in the game pretty consistently, yeah. and there's not going to be a ton of opportunities for them at the big league level. Again, we were down in spring training for a shorter period of time. We're not Michael Elias and Brandon Hyde getting to see these guys every day. We're talking about the spring training numbers. I don't think that Michael Elias and Brandon Hyde care all that much about the spring training numbers. It's more so your approach, your, you know, day-to-day work, how you look overall versus what the results are. If Heston Kerstad is hitting the ball really well, he feels good at the plate, he looks good, the process is there and the results just aren't there as much, they're going to be evaluating the process rather than the results. Colton Kowser is getting really good results right now, and it looks like it's really good process, which is the biggest thing for me. He looks really different at the plate right now. He seems a lot more comfortable. 
And his comfortability at the plate has seems like it has translated into the outfield as well, because that was something he talked about last season too, where he just kind of felt like a rookie where he would have struggles at the plate and that would translate into struggles in the outfield a little bit. And he was just, he was a little all over the place and he's just got a different mentality coming into year two. So for that reason, along with the quality numbers, I probably give Colton Kowser the leg up here. I think he already kind of had the leg up because he can play all three outfield positions. He can play a quality center field and you kind of need two center fielders at Oriole Park at Camden Yards for half the season. So yeah. I think for that reason, Colton Kowser has the leg up for me and there's a chance he could be a pretty regular right fielder if Anthony Santander is your DH and you're rotating him in with Ryan O'Hearn. So I would give Kowser again about an 80% chance to make the team right around where I got with Jackson Holiday. Let's talk Kobe Mayo. Okay. This one's an interesting conversation. Kobe Mayo, through his first 14 games, 323 batting average, an OPS over 1,000, 10 hits, five doubles, and a homer. He is still the same doubles machine that we saw a year ago at AAA Norfolk. Kobe Mayo is really, really good. Yeah. I think at the beginning of this offseason, and still I wouldn't have given him a great chance to make this team. If at the beginning of the offseason I gave it a 5% chance that Kobe Mayo makes the team, I would say I'm up to like a 20% chance. Because 20 is a lot. At 20, 20 is kind of a lot. Well, the thing, okay, let's talk about this. Because I last night while I was thinking about uh, my preparation for this podcast, all I could think about was what does he have to do to make the team? I, like, Ramon, I don't know if there's anything he could do. He would to have to take team. Ramon Urias' spot, right? Ramon like, that's Urias, the only, who, by the way, who, by the way, is also mashing. Hitting 304 yeah. with an OPS over 1,000 so it's, free you, home runs. You can't point to him and say he's not pulling his weight right now. No. Like, and he's a good player. So that's not really a guy you want to cut or trade. Um, so what? Like, where could he possibly fit into this team? That's the hard part of it. Like, I, I do think there is a chance he makes this team just because the bat is so overwhelmingly good. And from everything we have heard, the defense has taken a huge step this offseason, yes. which was the biggest thing for Kobe Mayo. Could he stick at third base defensively? Is the arm going to be there? Is he he's still going to stay athletic enough even as he gets bigger to stay at that position and Everything has come back as a resounding yes, where he is a quality defensive third baseman, along with just having a ridiculous hit tool. So I don't know what else he would have to do to make this team, other than the fact that the log jam would just have to somehow work itself out. If there was an injury, if there was a trade, anything like that, he could make the team, but he he feels a little redundant. Yeah, I was going to say... I think the best thing he can do is put himself, and he probably already is here, but put himself in the position that the second there's an injury or a trade, he's first first call. He's the first phone call is Kobe Mayo. Uh, Even if he doesn't necessarily fit the position, you bring him up and try to figure it out after that maybe. Um, Because you just need his bat in the major leagues because it's ready. Yeah. Um, Yeah, I mean, his numbers are ridiculous. Like you said, five doubles. At some point very recently, that led spring training. I'm not sure that's still true. Uh, but five doubles is in 14 games is pretty nuts. Um, he's just a hit machine, like you said. And, and if the defense is there, then he's one of the best prospects in baseball, which he already was. Um, so, yeah, I mean, he's just – he's so darn good, you know? And yeah. there's almost nothing more to say about him. The Orioles have three third basemen on the big league roster right now in yes. Gunnar Henderson, Jordan Westberg, and Ramon Arias. I think all three of those guys are roster locks. Maybe Arias becomes a trade piece down the line. I would be pretty shocked if they got rid of Arias. Like, Arias, again, if the bat is working, which it is right now in spring training, it's a gold glove glove at third base. See, if that wasn't the case, this probably gets a little bit easier for Kobe Mayo. Sure. But he's got to overcome a guy who can hit relatively well in the big leagues and has one of the best gloves at the hot corner. Yeah. Ramon Arias, the last few seasons, he hasn't been lighting the world on fire with the bat, but he's going to give you a 700-plus OPS year in and year out. Last year, it was a 703. 2022, it was a 720. In 21, it was a 774. And you'll take that. He's going to give you that year in and year out, along with elite defense at third base. And he can play second base as well, as can Jordan Westberg. So they're more versatile right now than Kobe Mayo. Maybe Mayo can stick in a corner outfield spot if he's trying to 
go to that avenue to make the big league club. We know he can probably play some first base as well, but the focus for him has been third. And down the line, I think Mayo profiles as an everyday starter. Right now, there's three guys ahead of him that I have a hard time seeing Mayo leapfrogging. So I give it about a 20% chance if something fluky happens that Kobe Mayo makes this team. But the big takeaway here is that three of your top four prospects, Samuel Basayo, much younger, has an injury. We haven't seen him catch. We, we just saw him get some first ABs the other day, which is great. Three of your top four prospects in Holiday, Kowser, and Mayo all look like everyday big league players with a heck of a lot of upside. Yeah. I mean, Which we knew, but it's nice to get it reinforced. It's nice to see it happen on a yeah. baseball field that's televised. Yeah. Some other storylines to hit. Corbin Burns officially named the Orioles opening day starter. This was a formality. We knew this was going to happen. It's his third consecutive season starting on opening day. Even if Kyle Bradish was healthy, I don't think this would have been a question. You traded for Corbin Burns to be the ace of the team. He is going to be the ace of your team, and he's going to start on opening day. If you're worried about his 12.71 ERA through his first five plus innings uh, do not be Brandon Hyde certainly is not we are certainly not I, know, I couldn't care less and about his number Corbin Burns said he feels good like that's what you're looking for out of a starting pitcher of Corbin Burns quality he's not going out there and trying to put up <clears throat> big numbers he's trying to build himself up for a 30 plus game workload in the regular season it's how do the pitches feel how are you locating how is your body feeling overall as you were getting prepared for a new season if that stuff is good then I am good with how Corbin Burns is looking in spring training. If Corbin Burns says he's cool, I'm cool. Yep. That's about as, as far as I'm going. I, I, the numbers couldn't mean less to me. Um, it, it's it's fine. And, you know, his first start on opening day in the Aaron Hicks homecoming game. Uh, <laughs> That's what it's, it's being called, <laughs> the Aaron Hicks homecoming. It'll be electric. Yeah. I'm excited for it. Yeah, the Orioles fans aren't calling it. You know, the first time they get to see Corbin Burns in an Orioles uniform, they're certainly referring to it as the Aaron Hicks homecoming. So that's what I've heard. Yeah, that's that's the rumor going around. So exciting that it is official. We kind of knew that because that was how the days lined up to opening day. It wasn't really a secret, but cool to see that officially be a thing. Yes. Corbin Burns is starting opening day for the Baltimore Orioles. You didn't think that was going to happen a couple months ago. No. Tell you what. That's but big. we did. We called it here right on the nest. We did. That's why you got to tune into the Bird's Nest live every Wednesday, 11 a.m. YouTube, Facebook. Good plug there, Bones. Good work. This weekend, we've got some exciting stuff coming up as well. How about the spring breakout? I think this is a really cool idea by Major League Baseball. It's essentially just showcasing as many top prospects as possible. 16 total exhibition games where each team is going to create a roster of their top prospects. And they're going to just duke it out this weekend. It's really cool. The Orioles take on the Pirates on Thursday, which is probably the most anticipated matchup of this spring breakout series. They are two of the five organizations in baseball that have at least five prospects in the top 100. We will once again get to see Jackson Holiday face off against Paul Skeens. For as much flack as Major League Baseball tends to get about marketing their players and figuring they out get how, a lot to, of flag how to grow the much. game, I think this is a really cool idea to showcase guys that you know are hopefully going to be stars in this league for years down the line yeah and you know i think we're hitting a bit of a transitional period in baseball a lot of the stars we grew up watching you and i especially are getting older yeah um and the you know the the prospects are turning the page on the next faces of the game and you're getting an opportunity to see them right here yeah. Uh, so I, I think, like you said, this is a cool idea, and I'm pretty excited about it. Yeah, we'll get another matchup on Thursday of Jackson Holiday against Paul Skeens, the yeah. last two number one overall picks, which is really neat. The rest of the Orioles roster got some really exciting names. Cade Povich, Trace Bright, headline the pitchers. I'm excited to watch Trace Bright. Me too. Um, had a really interesting year last year. The K per nine numbers were stupid good. Huge strikeout. The guy. only players that he was close to in terms of K per nine were Grayson Rodriguez and D.L. Hall. Um, so I'm pretty excited to see what Trace Bright can be this year. So that'll be fun. Catchers, we've got Samuel Basayo, Creed Willems, and Silas Ardwan. Silas Ardwan, by the way, had just five at-bats at big league spring training. Did have three hits. OPS over 2,000 yeah. for Silas Ardwan. So catchers. Showed up when it mattered. It's an exciting catchers group right there. Infielders, Jackson Holiday, Kobe Mayo, Connor Norby, Max Wagner, Leandro Arias, Freddie Ben Cosme. It's a cool group. Yeah, it is a cool group. 
And then oh. headlining the outfielders, Enrique Bradfield Jr., Dylan Beavers, Judd Fabian, Braylon Tavera. That's an exciting name there. Haven't seen much of Braylon Tavera. Was an international signing a couple of years ago. One of the Orioles' better prospects, but if you haven't gotten to see him in action at all because he was you know, playing at the FCL, now is a good chance to see some of these guys. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Tomas, or Thomas Sosa, John Rhodes, too. Yeah. Uh, a couple more exciting prospects as well. So, yeah, I mean... I'm sure the Orioles, you know, they they number one farm system in baseball for what feels like 87 years running now. Yep. Um, I think that they're probably going to draw the most eyeballs. Uh, and uh, against Paul Skeens, Termar Johnson, that should be fun. But it's going to be interesting to see what all these guys can do and how they all mix into the team and whatnot. I'm, I'm pretty f- excited to see it. Yeah, it's – I think everybody around baseball kind of knows that this Orioles Pirates matchup is the best one because it's two teams that have some of the better farm systems in all of baseball. So Thursday, tune into that game. That's going to be an exciting one. Other smaller storylines that we want to hit on from spring training, this bullpen battle, we should talk about some guys that we haven't talked about a ton. Keegan Aiken hasn't allowed a run, just one hit in his first five innings in spring training, five strikeouts. Same story for Brian Baker through four innings, hasn't allowed a run. Mike Bauman, four and two-thirds, hasn't allowed a run. Those guys aren't going away. They are right there in the bullpen battle. There are at least two spots up for grab, and up for grabs, excuse me, and, and those three guys are firmly in that conversation. I know they have been bouncing in and out of the big leagues over the last few years. Maybe they have had some frustrating outings here and there, but overall, it's three guys who have put up good numbers, and they're right there in the big league conversation. I think the most exciting part about this spring training for me has been that every guy that has shown up and, you know, you're naming everybody who's playing well right now in the bullpen, they're all showing up like, you know, this team, everybody knows this team can win a World Series this year. Yep. And everybody's coming with a hunger uh, and just everybody's vicious and they want to win. And, And that's just not always the case. We teams coming into spring training, you know, we got a little to Cole Irvin when he came into opening day or excuse me spring training last year with the A's he's pretty comfortable and when he get got to the Orioles he was like oh my goodness yeah I gotta catch up yeah and that is a great sign of what the managerial staff is doing the front office the kind of culture they're setting down I think that's the most exciting part for me is that the attitude is there for this squad and that they want to win and that they know this is a shot and for guys on the roster bubble, you want to be a part of a team yep, that could absolutely. win another AL East and could make a playoff push. So Keegan Aiken, Brian Baker, Mike Bauman, they've been shoving so far. Speaking of shoving, how about the Orioles' top two pitching prospects? Chase McDermott, six and two-thirds innings right now without a run. Five hits, three walks, ten strikeouts. He's probably not going to be in the starting rotation to crack big league camp. Brandon Hyde has said they would like to keep... McDermott, Povich, and Johnson down in the minor leagues to make sure they are seasoned and ready to go when they need them, but he's he's looking close. He's right there. Chase McDermott's in the conversation at least. Like they at least that question was prompted. You yeah. know? Like he could have been playing terribly and like they not even ask about it, but he's shoving. And, you know, this is the Jim Palmer Award winner from last year, was incredible in triple A after the jump from double A. And, you know, I kind of like that he's going to go down and get consistent starts. Same with Povich and Johnson. As they Um, should. Yeah, I agree. So, I mean, this is something to be excited about. The O's pitching prospects usually don't get as much love as the hitters do, but this group deserves it. Johnson, Povich, and McDermott, they're all really, really talented. And Seth Johnson, who we hear almost nothing about, he might be the most exciting one coming off not playing uh, and, and having an opportunity to bounce back in a huge way. So I'm really excited for all three of these guys. Povich, seven innings, one earned, nine strikeouts, three walks. If yeah. he is filling up the strike zone, that dude's dangerous. Yeah. He said it after, I think, his second outing where he just said, I need to trust my stuff. I need to throw it in the strike zone because it's good enough to get whiffs in the strike zone. They've just got to be in competitive locations. And so he is trusting his stuff. He's putting it in the strike zone, and he's getting results. Yeah. So really good to see from Cade Povich. If he can get those walk numbers down, if he can attack the strike zone, that is a really, really live arm from the left side. Excited for those two guys. Gunnar Henderson, we know he got off to a slow start in spring training, not numbers-wise, but just injury-wise. He was dealing with an oblique injury for a little while. Five games back, hitting 600. Yeah. He's good. You know, it's nice when 
the team says it's not a big deal, and then it actually isn't a big deal. And then it's actually not a big deal. That's, that's, <laughs> that's pretty nice. So, uh, nice yeah, for Gunnar Henderson. It looks Henderson. like going to be just fine, and that's really, really reassuring. Yep, looks good, looks healthy. Connor Norby, by the way, he was not in our you know kind of baby birds discussion, but he maybe should maybe have been. Maybe he should have been. Because he's hitting 455 with an OPS over 1,000 through he probably, his first six games. He probably wasn't just because he's even harder to find a spot for on this roster than Kobe yeah. Mayo. I, I mean, I just like that. That would have to be like I don't even. I think give Connor would. Norby probably a five percent chance to make this. Team I think that's and, high. Five percent honestly feels a little high. It's nothing <laughs> against Connor Norby. He's who elite. Is probably <laughs> He's a top one hundred prospect. Any other team around baseball is probably looking Clamoring at Connor Norby, over him. licking their chops, thinking about a potential opening day starter, regular, everyday yes. regular at second base. And unfortunately for Connor Norby in the Baltimore Orioles organization. Uh, <laughs> I, I, what sorry can't do <laughs> like, i just i can't yeah. make an argument to find a place for him on this big league team which is again good problem to have but it's you, but, you know there's gotta... a guy who you can keep your eye on all year and oh in yeah triple a and say and you know hopefully i'll have another great year but say wow that's another guy that they have an option of and, and another guy who's an option for an injury if he's not the first call if Kobe Mayo's the first call, Connor Norby might be the second call. I agree. Yeah. Up to the big league roster. Absolutely. And Norby is the same way. He's trying to be more versatile as well. Could potentially see him in a corner outfield. So he, he's trying to find ways to make this big league club. It's just, uh, it's just not a lot of room. But good to see him playing well in spring training. After, again, only he's only got six games so far, working his way up a little bit. And Jorge Mateo, the bat's looking good so far. 917 OPS through his first 10 games of the spring. That's at least encouraging. We're not going to take a ton from spring training games. We learned our lesson last year a little bit with Jorge Mateo, where he had a fantastic April and then his only home run of the season came on an inside the park home run after the month of April. But Jorge Mateo has made some adjustments at the plate. And if those adjustments can carry into the season, we know how valuable he is defensively at shortstop, potentially in center field, left field as well, maybe second base. If you can get him in the lineup with Everything else that is so dangerous about him, if the bat is at least fine, you take that from Jorge Mateo. And I'll tell you what, I'll never forget his forehead performance in game two of the ALDS. You can't. He was fantastic. He was really good. And, yeah, I mean, we're going to see him center field probably. So, yeah. um, X-Factor guy. He's versatile. He brings great speed. He's a good defensive replacement. If the bat is fine, then Jorge Mateo is, is a really valuable piece to have on this team. Whew, we ran through a lot of storylines. We did. Did we miss anything? Probably. Probably. We probably not. did. If we did miss something, let us know in the comments. Thank you so much for following along with us live here on Facebook and YouTube. If you didn't catch us live, you can catch us after the fact on Spotify, SoundCloud, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, wherever you get your podcasts or your digital shows. You can catch myself and Matt Bonaparte on the bird's nest we're just a few weeks away from opening day we've got some fun shows here over the next couple of weeks we're going to be doing another fantasy draft fantasy drafting the orioles 40-man roster trying to build the best team for 2024 we're going to do our season predictions we're going to have an opening day preview show we're going to have a ton of content coming your way here on our Mass and Orioles social pages. So make sure you're staying up to date. Big thank you to Bobby Blanco behind the scenes for producing this one. For Matt Bonaparte, I am Brendan Mortensen, and we'll catch you next time.